Good evening, welcome to News Night here on Metro Television. My name is Bridget Osu. Thank you very much for joining us. The headlines tonight. President Mahama weighed into the debate over the bruised Ghanaian economy, advising government to seek an IMF bailout. Meanwhile, leadership of the Trade Union Congress is warning government against any attempt to seek an IMF bailout, but rather rely on homegrown solution. Leadership of uh, the Arise Ghana Pressure Group Secure Police Inquiry Bill for all 28 persons arrested during the protest on Tuesday at the Obra Sports in Accra. And in news from elsewhere, United States President Joe Biden announces a new $800 million military package to aid Ukraine, to Ukraine, bringing the total since he took office to nearly $7 billion. Right, and our very first story tonight, and uh, former President Mahama has taken the ruling NPP government to the cleanest for mismanaging the economy and pushing it to the brink of collapse. During the launch of a think tank, Think Progress Ghana, on the theme Ghana's debt burden, reflections and solutions, the former president, among other things, asked the president to immediately dismiss the finance minister, Ken Oforiata, for leading the country to a path of self-destruction. According to former President John Dramani Mahama, the Ekufuadu administration has proven to be clueless as to how best to manage the economy. He said though the country seems to be having an economic meltdown, President Ekufuadu and his team have shown little appreciation of the situation, adding if physical discipline is not ensured, Ghana is likely to go entirely broke like Sri Lanka. President Ekufuadu and his head of the economic management team and his finance minister have no clue in what direction to lead this country. They have dug their heels in, remained obstinate, and have become totally impervious to sound proposals to rescue the economy and mitigate the extreme economic hardships that Ghanaians are grappling with. They have simply refused to do what is necessary to arrest the decline. The suffering and pain experienced by Ghanaians do not seem enough to jolt the Akufuado Baumia government into action. They remain tone deaf and dead set in the very misguided ways that have brought us to our knees as a country. Somehow, they have, they have convinced themselves that by refusing to do the heavy lifting required, they can wait out the economic storm and that stability and normalcy will return as a matter of due course. The most that people of Ghana have been given are inspired rhetoric, denials, and a litany of unconvincing excuses as to about how we came to this painful juncture as a nation. The former president also called on the president to immediately, among other measures, dismiss the finance minister, Ken Ofuriata. It will serve the president well to use some items from the presidential toolkits in times of crisis such as, as this. There's a toolkit with some items in it that presidents can use when they are faced with this kind of crisis. The first is he should address the nation and explain the situation in which we are and rally the support of the citizens behind any economic program that he wants to put forward. The second is he should fire his finance minister Well, the third is, he should conduct a major shake-up of his government to remove all the many dead woods that have turned ministries into their kingdoms. And then finally, he should huddle with the best brains of this country 
to formulate a comprehensive recovery plan for our economy. John Mahama further advised government to seek an IMF bailout due to the nature and depth of Ghana's economic problems. This government knows that the wisest thing to do in these circumstances is to improve our reserve position, and that is to seek balance of payment support from multilateral institutions like the IMF. Because this, this balance of payment support will come at concessionary rates and at very minimal cost. That are certainly nowhere near the astronomical and prohibitive cost that, they are, uh, uh, that is associated with this syndicated one, one billion loan. We wish to serve notice going forward that the NDC in Parliament will not support any further non-concessionary borrowing or loans that are not project specific with clear and unambiguous terms of the benefit to our nation. And our former finance minister, Sir Tekpa, says the government should blame itself for the current state of affairs, which has been worsened by the reckless expenditure. And I always, when I'm asked that question, I say, what is the alternative? What is the alternative? Let the government give us an alternative. If it is the budget, and what is in the budget, we saw it. The markets are not convinced, they saw it. Right, the Bank of Ghana itself said it. Bank of Ghana said it. Fiscal, you can go and read the NPC report for me, you know, of 2021. That we lack, you know, fiscal credibility. Right, so that's the point, that's the reality. Well, the IMF is designed for developing countries that are problems, that is the issue. You see, if, you, if your central bank cannot help you and you don't have your boom buffers, that is what the fund is established to do for developing countries. That's why countries go, and that's why, have you seen any developing country, you know, doing well with, you know, let's say commodity prices going high and, and having reserves? Have you heard about any of them saying we are going to IMF? It's only during crisis. So the only, the only way you can avoid an IMF program is to build your own buffers. Yes, it's to build your own buffers. And, and, and even that, the and exactly, the key one is the stabilization fund. But you also do debt management. Okay. And you do contingency fund. Okay. We put money in the contingency fund. The first time we drew the, the contingency fund was when the Kwame Nkrumah fire and, and a flood disaster occurred. But today we haven't put anything in the contingency fund. We are only using it as a post office to take money out of the stabilization fund for consumption. Well, the Trades Union Congress has advised government not to seek an international monetary fund bailout to address the economic challenges facing the country. Now, the General Secretary, Dr. Yao Ba, who was speaking at a forum in Accra, charged government to engage social partners and stakeholders to come out with homegrown policies to ensure the economy thrive. The two-day meeting, which was among others, was to review the half-year activities of the union. It was on the team, the impact of high interest rates on social economic growth and employment creation. General Secretary Dr. Yao Ba said Ghana has gone to IMF 16 times and yet has nothing to show. We have advised government not to go to IMF because IMF has no solution for Ghana. Let me tell you, government has been to IMF 16 times for IMF programs. But we are where we are today. <laughs> Therefore, that is not uh, the solution. It's like saying that this is not working, so let's do more of it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Dr. Ba called on the Bank of Ghana to review its inflation targeting monetary policy it was currently implementing since it had not achieved the desired results. If you increase interest rates, first, you are saying that you are not going to allow businesses to borrow as much as they can to expand. And if businesses don't expand, it means that they cannot create more jobs. So in the private sector, one of the things that is really, really hampering growth has to do with high interest rates, both businesses and households. If you are an individual or a household, you want to borrow money, you are likely to pay as high as 28%. The high interest rate, Dr. Ba said, was affecting the businesses and causing job losses out of the active workforce of 12 million people. Only about 2 million were employed. So let's revisit the um, um, uh, 
the demonstration that happened, the Chrome ISU demonstration that happened. And it's not just those who took to the streets. There are millions who did not take to the street, but whose lives are equally affected. And an, among the number of issues raised by the Arise Ghana demonstrators were the high cost of fuel, a full-scale bipartisan parliamentary probe into COVID-19 expenditure, the implementation of e-levy, among others. But those who could not join the process say they are feeling the pinch too. Hundreds of protesters for two days marched through principal streets in Accra to demand better living conditions from the government as prices of goods and services continue to soar, making them worse off. Their concerns resonate with a lot more Ghanaians across the country. <laughs> If you are listening to me, know that you have done well, but you need to do more. It's difficult here in Ghana, but it's better than other places. It's our own fault the cost of living in Ghana is on the rise. We keep increasing prices to unbearable levels. The prices of everything have increased. They keep increasing prices of goods, but our salaries remain the same. The country is in a mess. The president has disappointed us. I really trusted him and voted for him, thinking he was going to change our lives. In a day, I spent 20 Ghana cities alone on my transportation. That, in addition to my feeding, is about 60 Ghana cities. How do I even save? Ghana has become unbearable. Ekufuado has done well, but he has to do more. People keep robbing others because there is financial stress hating everyone. Since 1992, I haven't seen such Divine Jokoto, however, thinks Ghanaians too must share the burden. Uh, things are a little bit hard. I will not say too hard because we are hearing news from other countries. Even America, Belgium, and other places are complaining. We are a very small country. We don't even produce anything. Why wouldn't we feel the hardship? There's hardship. But about the youth, I just want to advise them. You don't just sit up and say things are hard. What are you doing as a youth to help the government? All of us are looking for white collar jobs. Where are the jobs? There are a lot of lands we can farm. Today we are crying, there's no corn, there's no wheat, there's no planting. Why can't the youth go into farming? The organizers of the demonstration says they will continue to mount pressure on the government until their concerns are addressed. Right, and um, leaders of the Arise Ghana demonstration have secured a police inquiry bill for all 28 persons arrested during the protest on Tuesday at the Obras Sport in Accra. Now, according to the communications officer of the National Democratic Congress, Sami Jemfi, leadership of the protest will stand by all persons affected during the clash with the police uh, on day one of the protest. Leaders of the pressure group Arise Ghana have been visiting persons injured or arrested as a result of the clash with the police on day one of the Krum Ayeshe demonstration. Communications officer of the National Democratic Congress, Sami Jemfi, who is also a leading member of the protesters, said the group has been able to secure a bill for all 28 persons arrested as a result of the protest. The official information we were given was that 28 arrested persons are still in detention. Nine at Nima Police Station, nine at Tesano, four at La, uh, one lady at Ministries, and another four at another police station. Um, like I said, we've gotten uh, three sureties to stand for those at Tesano, the nine. We are in the process of getting um, sureties for those in the other 
police stations. But like I said, we are optimistic that by close of day, we should have been able to uh, complete the process. The group proceeded to the Kolebu Eye Clinic to visit Ni Ayi Mensa, whose right eye was badly wounded during the clash. Bernard Mona, also a leading member of the protest, said they will support all persons arrested or injured as a result of the protest. What we are doing is that, as a group, we have decided that whatever medical expenses that will be associated with those who are injured, it will be our responsibility. We will do everything, including mobilizing from you, the public, to support them. We will not abandon anyone. It is our duty to seek economic reprieve for ourselves. And if in the course of doing that, the government decides to punish the citizens in this reckless manner, we are ready to take the punishment. The team then proceeded to Alajo to visit Bernard Lai, another victim of the clash. He narrated his ordeal with the news team. So I tried to, I mean, escape one of my, this leg especially, locked a car. So I have to pull myself out. Pulling myself out, I, I was going down. So my knee heated the ground. I realized at a point in time, I have to, I'm trying to, I mean, get back. I'm motionless now. I could not, but the crowd too were coming. So I have to force with this left leg and just get up, hip one or two. Then one of our colleagues grabbed me. That is when I was able to, I mean, leave the scene. According to the data from the leadership of the group, hundreds of their comrades have been injured as a result of the protest. They are assured they will visit and support all persons injured. Meanwhile, member of parliament for a Blakema South constituency, Alfred Okovanderpoi, has called on Parliament to summon the Inspector General of Police over the violence that occurred during the demonstration. And I'm somebody who takes the words of my IGP very seriously. So three days ago when I heard the marching orders that were issued and giving out to our police force or service uh, as regards to how they should conduct themselves with the demonstration, I was highly happy. And I was hoping that the words of the IGP will be carried out in implementing how the police will deal with the demonstration. But unfortunately, I was disappointed. I was disappointed that the actions of the police did not match what the IGP had commanded or commanded. And I was really disappointed that the IGP with his leadership will do that. But I'm hoping that we will do it in parliament. I think there are there has been other police brutalities in the past and Parliament, I'm sure, would invite the IGP and we will add this incident and this situation to it so that we can, we, can, we can question the IGP and find out why things went the way it did. Yes, so Parliament, I'm sure we will take care of that. So it's already been a year uh, since some youth of Ejura hit the street to protest the death of an activist, uh, Ibrahim Mohammed, popularly known as Kaka. Now, while families of the deceased were preparing to mark the first anniversary, the police seized the police in Ejura secured a court injunction to stop them from going ahead with the Islamic prayers and Quran recitals that were planned. And we'll go on the phone and speak to a spokesperson for the family, Nafiu Mohammed. A very good evening and thank you very much for joining us. Good evening, my dear. Right. Uh, just to try and uh, explain to us, uh, with the injunction secured, what can the family do? If it's not external, can anything be done uh, at home? to mark the one-year anniversary? Actually, the family have decided solemnly, the family have prayed for their lost one. Actually, the program is scheduled to take place today. Okay. And God willing, the program, the program has been earmarked. As to uh, at the cemetery and come back to see any recitals, that one was injunctive. But okay. But the family, we have 
earmarked for the day. Okay. Is there a reason given to that for the injunction? Why did the police seek an injunction if you're mourning your, your beloved? Actually, it started from the organization. When we started to put up the organization, we started with organizing the program. The three families, the Kakash family, late not the Nazareth family and Muntala Mohammed family made together. They started the discussion. Thereafter, when we had our plan ready, we had the program lineup, and we have the lecture for the invitation written up. The first person we contacted as a family is the Edra Traditional Council through the leadership, which is Edra Hene, a very much here the second. We informed him, and he was happy about our movement. So he also lived with us, and we were planning together. It right. got to the point that Edra Traditional Council or the chief also set a committee. The committee was also to put in place some measures to help the program on. But all along on the way, the, pro the, the committee he set also brought a different program lineup. Right. Di different to the one we have. So then in an issue with the family, the family did not get it well with the program he is proposing. So the family says they want to go along with the program they have planned, and he said he will not switch to any program except the one with the committee. So the, the family departed from the committee and continued with the organization. Already seen they are the original organizers of the program. Okay, all right. Thank you so very much. We could, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for talking to us. There. And, um, right, right. Well, our correspondent is also on the ground. Uh, he'll be t give it, coming in uh, with uh, the current situation of uh, compensation that was to be given to those who were injured. And also, we lost two persons, don't forget, on that day. And uh, what's become of all the recommendations will bring you subsequent in our subsequent uh, bulletin. Now, Minister of uh, Transport, Kweku Furi Siyama, has told Parliament that due processes were followed in the award of contracts for COVID-19 tests at the Kotoka International Airport to Frontier Health Services. Now, the minister, who appeared before the House to respond to questions, emphasized that the Ghana Airport Company strictly adhered to the Public Procurement Act on sole sourcing before engaging the company to run COVID tests at the airport. The appearance of the Transport Minister to Parliament follows a threat issued by the Speaker for him to show up to respond to questions by MPs. The Minister, in response to a question by Tamale Central MP Mutala Mohammed, said all the procurement laws were followed by the Ghana Airport Company before the contract was awarded to Frontiers Health Services. The Speaker arise to ask the Minister for Transport whether proper procurement laws were followed in the award of the contract between Government of Ghana and Frontier Health Service, Services, as well as the contract between Frontier Health Services and the First Atlantic Bank for the purposes of collecting the charges for the COVID-19 test at the airport. The company sought and secured a, approval from the Public Procurement Authority before the award of the space to Frontier Health Services Group was done. Mr. Speaker, Ghana Airport Company Limited is not privy to the contract between Frontier Health Services and the First Atlantic Bank for the purpose of collecting charges for COVID-19 tests at the airport. Kweku Fure Siyama also revealed to Parliament that management of the Ghana Airport Company has held meetings with Magdan Aviation to resolve the instances of regulatory breaches before work can begin at the private jet terminal. Mr. Speaker, I rise to ask the Minister for Transport steps the Ministry is taking to address purported instances of regulatory breaches by Magdan Aviation as contained in official communication from the Ghana Airports Company Limited. Mr. Speaker, Ghana Airport Company Limited has held a series of meetings with Magdan Aviation Handling Services Limited to resolve the instances of regulatory breaches. The party considered and agreed on the following why, Mr. Speaker, safety and security issues. A. McDonald Aviation to present safety management manual and airport security program to GSCR. B. GSCR to retrain McDonald Aviation staff under the directive of Ghana Civil Aviation Authority. The status of implementation. 
And we're going on the phone line to speak to the Tamale Central MP, uh, Mutalab Mohammed Ibrahim, who posed the question on why he isn't convinced by the answers given by the Transport Minister. Very good evening and thank you very much for joining us. Good evening, Mutalab. Right, we'll try and get him back on the line to find out, you know, why he does not believe what the minister, and if he has evidence to the contrary, and also, uh, you know, if he intends to put the question back to the House or reframe his questions or bring the evidence that uh, would uh, that he would make public for us all to uh, dissect. All right, so we'll move on to some more stories now, and. Um, the president of the Ghana Bar Association, Yabwafu, has expressed worry over the incessant intent of government to take over some citizens urging authorities to employ stringent measures to curb the menace. I understand we have uh, Musala Mohammed back on the line, Tamale Central MP. A very good evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good right. So um, your question was answered. Uh, you were not convinced. Why? First and foremost, the minister in his response said that proper contracts were entered into. We all do know that the Minister for Health, when he appeared before the appointment committee, stated that the Frontier Health Services operated initially without a license, and as a Minister for Health, he was unaware of their operation at the, at the airport. Airport, yes. So at, at what point in time did they have the agreement? Two, the Minister also said that they were not interested in wanting to find out the contract between Frontier Health and the first atlantic bank mind you the airport is a security installation and a minister for transport should be concerned about any private person who wants to do business there right the issue is not the fact that the people were doing the business in their bank but they were operating at the airport now what i demanded was that he should furnish parliament with the contractual agreement when the contract comes out this minister will be exposed big time because we know what we know and it is very clear he was not being truthful to the people of this country. Will the speaker allow that? Well, the speaker has given him one week to present the, 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 the contract, as I demanded. Because I, I demanded that he should furnish parliament with the contract. So once we get the contract, we would know when the contract was entered into, we would know the terms and conditions of the contract, and Ghanaians will be shocked that the government of Ghana entered into contractual arrangement with a private entity and they charged $150 on every person who was tested there, yet government of Ghana was given only $2. That is just ridiculous. So we are waiting for the, the contract document to be made available and we'll take it from there. All right. Thank you very much for talking to us. Uh, Musala Mohammed is the Tamale yeah. Central uh, Member of Parliament. Um, we're taking our very first break. When we come back, we'll look at some more stories, including one from the Ghana Bar Association. Stay with us here on Newsnight. Back to Newsnight on Metro Television. We're live on Facebook at Newsnight and at Metro TV Ghana. Also on Twitter at Metro TV GH. Let's continue with the rest of our stories. And the president of the Ghana Bar Association, Yao Buafo, has expressed worry over the incessant intent of government to take over of government takeover by some citizens, urging authorities to employ stringent measures to curb the menace. He was speaking at the 40th Remembrance Service of the three justices of the Supreme Court, kidnapped and murdered under the Provisional National Defense Council in Accra. The Remembrance Service was to honor three justices of the Supreme Court who were kidnapped and killed by persons alleged to be members of the Provisional National Defense Council after a ruling purported to go against the government. The nation's worst fears became a reality when it was announced that Mr. Justice Fred Pukusa Akudia, Mrs. Justice Cecilia Cranton Adam, and Mr. Justice Kojo Ejei Ejapon, all judges of the High Court, and Major Sam Akwa, a retired army officer, had been most brutally and savagely murdered on the night of the abduct abduction. This cruel, savage and heartless act occurred at the Bundasi military range in the Accra Plains. The bodies of these precious Ghanaians had been doused with petrol and set on fire. 
urging members of the legal fraternity to uphold the rule of law always, the president of the Ghana Bar Association admonished the government to remain vigilant to safeguard Ghana's democracy. These unfortunate events, the rendition of which has been just been given, happened in the aftermath of a coup d'etat, a period associated with lawlessness and impunity. The horrible acts and consequences associated with such regimes, both home and abroad, are well documented to bear repeating. It is why the Ghana Bar Association has found it unfortunate and uncomfortable some recent misguided statements and or suggestions from certain quarters for a coup in this country because of people's personal or parochial interests and all their disagreements and differences with the current regime and perspectives as to how things ought to be done. Democratic governance and constitutional rule, as we have in Ghana under the 1992 constitution, providing for constitutionalism, fundamental human rights, including periodic free and fair elections, despite its peculiar imperfections, is still a superior alternative to any other known form of governance. Coup d'etats have deleterious if consequences. The lives of the martyrs we commemorate today should be a lesson to all of us. None of them held political offices. They were members of a constitutionally created judiciary carrying out their duty of administering justice, yet their lives were brutally cut short. A former parish priest of the Christ the King Catholic Church, Reverend Father Andrews Campbell, SVD, in his sermon, spoke on the need to forgive and eschew hate and derogatory speech at all times. Having these three judges before us as role models, if we follow them and follow their lives, we'd be a happier people. Every one of us here has been hurt. Every one of us. We've been hurt by others. Our family, our friends, our workmates. We've all been hurt in one way or the other. And we can't keep grudges. We cannot keep on thinking and not forgiving. The event saw in attendance the president of Ghana, Nana Ekufuado, and his vice, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, the Chief Justice, Christian Yeboah, the Attorney General, who doubles as the Minister of Justice, Godfrey Yeboah Dame, and some justices, judges, and magistrates from the various courts in the country. And let's look at some crime-related stories and the wife and some family members of a 35-year-old fetish priest who is a suspect in the gruesome murder of an 80-year-old man at Poto in the Agotima Zopa district of the Volta region are appealing to the police to offer them protection. Now, according to them, they have received death threats for the past few days by some youth of Poto. Last week... The headless body of an 80-year-old Afetoyesu was found after he was reported missing. The deceased was a homeowner who, according to reports, was escorting a potential tenant called Gadba, who approached him for accommodation after he was left stranded at Wotipo, a suburb of Beto. But the old man failed to return home only for his headless body to be found by a search party led by the youth in the community. Gadba, now the prime suspect, has since been on the run. Police, however, arrested two persons, including a fetish priest, Agbemafi Donyo, at Wotipo, who is believed to have harbored the suspect at his home days before the murder. <laughs> Even water, they don't want to sell it to us. Staying at home is even a problem. They always throw stones at us. Even a family member formed a gang to kill us. His wife is also left in a similar fashion a day after news of the killing of the old man broke. Following the incident, the youth reportedly besieged the home of Admemefle Donyo, set his shrine ablaze, and destroyed some other structures and deities. Agitated youths have also vowed not to bury the body of the old man until his missing head is found. Meanwhile, police in the area are on a manhunt for Gadba, the prime suspect. Wife and sister of the suspect say they no longer feel safe following threats and stigmatization from other residents. The guy took the person out and the person doesn't come back again. So that's what they say, uh, my husband was the one, or my husband's house was the place that the guy was living. 
So that's the reason why they come here and burn everything, do whatever they want to do. So please, our life is in danger. She added that since her husband was arrested, they were not able to withstand the stigma. We are here, we want you people to help us because our life is in danger. You for in town are threatening us to kill us. We don't know what's happened. So please, we need your help. We need you to guide us so that they will not kill us or they will not harm us in the town. So because of fear, we don't sleep at home. Always we are, we are afraid, so always we are inside. So we need your help so you can help us so that they will not do anything to us. News, we understand fuel price will go down by what percentage and its impact. Uh, Winston Taki will join me after the break to explain all that to you. We'll be right back. Welcome back to News Night Live on Metro TV. My name is Winston Taki. And now to a first business story. The Ghana Tourism Authority says effective Friday, July 1st, it will close down hotels in the Volta region or T regions operating without licenses. This was revealed by the Volta and OT regional manager of the Ghana Tourism Authority, Alexander Nketia, in an extensive interview with Metro News. According to the Volta and OT Regional Manager of the Ghana Tourism Authority, over 30% of hospitality facilities in the two regions are operating illegally. He said the authority is taking steps to address the menace as they have decided to go after these centers to ensure they can be regulated. He said those who have remained adamant from doing the right thing would be closed down. Those who are operating illegally in the system to quickly, before we come and finish them, we fish them out. But if we've not fished you out yet and you are out there, please quickly come to the office and regularize your operations before we find out, find your course. When we find you out, we will go through the same punitive measures that we have applied to those who are currently on the list. And especially uh, the hostels around the various tertiary institutions mm -hmm. that are refusing to comply. We are coming after them. They will be part of this exercise and they should get ready that they will be closed down and so they should quickly come in before they start inconveniencing their students in the hostels. He however gave the assurance that the exercise would be done with human face to ensure that the facilities are licensed. It is not an every year, every day thing. It depends on the exigencies of the situation. I mean, if we look at, if we look at, we realize that a lot of the or there are quite a number of facilities in the system that are refusing to uh, regularize their activities. That's why we engage in this enforcement exercise. But for the issues of routine checks, routine uh, spot checks, inspections, monitoring, that is something we do regularly. Now, the full implementation of the e-levy is set to commence on July 1st, 2022. Meanwhile, a financial management consultant says the e-levy has minimal impact on the profitability of banks. Clearly, from certain quarters that are quite closer to par, uh, the e-levy was expected to have generated about 600 million by this time, but we are doing just about uh, 60 million. And this represents just about 10% of its um, achievement rate. And we say this is quite abysmal, uh, judging from the expectation of government. But in whichever way that you want to view it from, uh, payment by customers to suppliers and the other creditors will have to be made. And uh, people are rather drawing cash or issuing checks for some of these payments. We will say people are leaving money in their savings accounts instead of uh, on their mobile money wallets, just marginally and not really doing that much of an impact to the profitability of these banks. But I would say um, traffic in the banking halls for these activities have actually increased. That either to um, these customers were actually performing it uh, by themselves uh, from, from the comfort of their homes with their mobile phones.
Now, away from that, the prices of petroleum products are expected to witness some mixed reviews at the pump stations by Saturday, 2nd July 2022. This is based on data from the bulk oil distribution companies. The price of petrol is expected to go down by almost 7% per litre. Let's now bring you the price projection on your screens as of now. So the current price for petrol is at Levin City, as you can see on your screen. And when the 8% is applied, we are likely to see uh, that is, it goes down. You gotta see a 10 CD, 12 pesos per litre at the pump come 2nd of July. And 14 Ghana cities is how much we sell diesel at the pump. When the 3% is applied, we see the price going up by 14 CD, 42 pesos. And when it comes to LPG gas, liquefied petroleum gas, and the price is Levin City, and the price going down by 7%, you get to witness a 10 Ghana City, 67 pesos at the pump. So that is the current price, should it be effective come July 2nd, 2022. Now we eat for business here on News Night. My name is Winston Taki. We take a break. We'll be back with sports after this break. Stay tuned. It's 48 past 19 hours GMT here in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. My name is Feo John Quarte, and it's time for sports. Ahead of the FIFA Under-20 World Cup, that's the ladies, the national Under-20 team known as the Black Princesses are expected to tour Europe. The national Under-20 female side, the Black Princesses, will camp in Europe for two weeks as the team continue their preparations ahead of the 2022 FIFA Under-20 World Cup in Costa Rica between August 10 and 28. The Black Princesses, who will be camping between July 15 and 30, are expected to play European giant France in a friendly game at the Clairefontaine, the National Football Centre that specialises in training French football players on Friday, July 29. Head coach Ben Foucault will use the two-week tour to put final touches to the team's preparations ahead of the Biennial International Women's Youth Football Championship 
as the team has set their sights on going past the group stage for the first time, having failed on five occasions. Ghana sealed a 5-1 victory on aggregates against Ethiopia in the final round of qualifiers to join Nigeria as the two African reps for the Global Youth Tournament. At the tournament in the Central American country, the Black Princesses will face the United States of America, Netherlands and Japan in Group D. Well, away from that, let's focus on the Commonwealth Games, which is staged in Birmingham, the United Kingdom. We've been told by the national boxing team coach, Coach Asari Dagana, must try as much as possible to invest into amateur boxing. You know, Ghana is uh, bound with a whole lot of talent. And that one, I can, I can bet you that we have a whole lot of Samotechi around here. They are working very, very hard. They need to be pushed. Ghana needs to invest in boxing. Boxing is one of the sports that we have, the talents abundant here. So uh, I think uh, that is one problem. We need to harness this talent. We don't have to let it go. Most of our boxers who don't do well when they go to professional and all these things, it's because of uh, management and things. But when it comes to talent, I can tell you they are very, very good. That's your sports. My name is Phil John Corti. Desi, over to you. Thank you very much, Phil. Up next is Entertainment News. My name is Desmond Okreko Danza. Now, French ambassador to Ghana and Sophie Ave has called on all Ghanaians to collectively be responsible for the promotion of tourism in the country if we want to attract more tourists. She spoke earlier on Entertainment Review. These sites, you need to have some sort of a explanation mm. of what the site is about yeah. so some sort of tourist guidance uh, someone that tells you someone who tells you the history of it the story behind it and it's also important that everyone in the neighborhood is proud of that site to tell tourists go there yeah you should visit here mm -hmm. at, at the desk hotel the uber driver taxi driver anyone should be able to say oh while you are here in Cape Coast, why don't you go to see Almina? Why, if you have two hours, then why don't you go to Kakum? And why don't you go all the way up to... So, you know, they should be able to um, be proud of, of the tourist sites and the places. They should be able to advertise uh, which restaurants are by the beach that we should recommend, which beaches might be nice to go. You know, really be able to have a give information to, mm. to the tourist okay. and to do that we really need to have everyone being proud of, of their sites know them and be proud of of their um, tourist sites but also feel responsible for these tourist sites if you have a, a mosque a beautiful 600 years old mosque that is a, an incredible heritage on the middle of a village it is the responsibility of the entire village to maintain the area and if you want to attract tourists, there shouldn't be some plastic and, and garbage uh, everywhere around. So it's everyone's responsibility to keep the place neat. So when people come, they see a nice place where this, this heritage is like in a jewel box, the village being the jewel box, that has be, to be absolutely neat. So it's everyone's responsibility to actually treat that heritage like, like something that was given to us. And the diplomats also urged Ghanaian artists to unite and support each other to be able to get to make a global impact. What it needs to be done is getting together um, and, and perform together. If one of them goes to perform, uh, he will gather a crowd. But if there's two of them on stage, they will gather an even bigger crowd. If there's three or four of them, it puts Ghana out there. And... Um, I think that's the way forward. I know that Sarkozy is doing something with uh, Wizkid uh, mm. in, in New York, I think, in the US. Uh, it's uh, a concert that's called It's About Time. And I think it's a great, great move. And I'm sure other artists will also join on stage. And um, Sark Sarkozy also uh, joined um, Kitty and, and Kwame Eugene in O2 to surprise them along, uh, along other artists. And I think that really is the way to go. Because as I said, it's impossible not to love at least one Ghanaian artist. Yeah. There's, there's such a diversity. Um, if you put many on stage, mm. then it's, it will attract much more people. And there is a synergy, not because you love one, you will not lo love another. another it's not yeah. a choice. It's like 
it adds up. Mm -hmm. Once you discover one that is doing a featuring with another one, then you want to know what this other one is doing. Yeah. And then it just adds up to your playlist. And that's all for entertainment. My name is Desimondo Krekudan, so Bridget is standing by with the rest of the bulletin. Hello, Bridget. Thank you, Desi, the star boy. International News is next. United States President Joe Biden has said the U.S. will soon announce a new $800 million military aid package to Ukraine, bringing the total since he took office to nearly $7 billion. Biden said the aid which will be announced in the coming days will include advanced air defense system and artillery support as Ukraine continues to face a Russian offensive in the eastern uh, Donbass region. very much for joining us uh join us again tomorrow at 7 p.m uh, good evening ghana will come on from 9 p.m my name is bridget also have a good evening